a startling find in the Alberta oil sands. This is easily one of the best preserved dinosaur fossils of any kind ever found. It's unquestionably one of those one in a billion shots. It's one of the world's most perfectly preserved dinosaurs. It looks so close to being freshly dead, I could almost hear it breathing. Wow. And it sparks a prehistoric mystery. Forensic scientists and paleontologists are both dealing with bodies. What killed it? Fire. Oh, OK. And how did a huge dinosaur end up perfectly preserved? Why was it not scavenged, rotted, and fallen apart? Where it doesn't belong. A lot of the clues are on the body. Cracking a mystery 110 million years old. Dinosaur Cold Case. Just an average morning, like every other morning. I was operating that day a cable shovel. It's a big machine. The bucket scoop holds about 100 tons. When I actually was raking up the bank, Slabs were coming down the face of the bank that I was digging in, and those slabs were like something I hadn't seen before. We knew we had found a fossil of some sort, but uh, right away I knew it was something different. We got a call from the Suncor Mining Company they knew they had something interesting, but they had no idea what it was. We had to get up there as soon as possible to see what it is, how big is it, and what is it going to take to get it out of the ground. When we went up to Fort McMurray, they had a few chunks that they'd rescued. So we're thinking, this looks good, could be interesting. The team takes a closer look at the exposed section of the fossil. It was split through, so we haven't got the whole thing. We weren't seeing the original outside. We were seeing broken rib and bony plates. Don recognizes the distinctive features of a massive prehistoric animal. Right away, we knew it was going to be something good, but we had no idea how good it was going to be. Now, like any investigator, Don must secure the area and ensure as much evidence as possible can be collected. They spend two days picking through the rubble. To figure out what this animal is, we also need to record the physical setting that it was in, because that's important to interpret. How did it get there? Maybe even how did it die? They clear away the rock around the fossil. We need to carefully extract it and not lose any pieces. To protect it, they encase what's left of the body and surrounding sediment in plaster. So we had it isolated as a single chunk. And then that's what we thought we could lift out. Just take them up very slow, Sam. Very slow. Here She only just started to move the dirt and she let go. Yeah, she didn't take much pressure. At the time, it was gut-wrenching. It sat there in the ground for 110, 112 million years, and here in a fraction of a second, we thought we'd ruined it. What have we lost? Is the evidence gone before the team can even unlock its secrets? They send the pieces to the lab at the Royal Tyrrell Museum, where a crack team gets to work. 
I started working on the specimen in uh, April of 2011. The specimen came in a variety of blocks, ranging from hand size to blocks that probably weighed over a ton. And you can see very little when it arrives. Paleo technician Mark Mitchell carefully chips away at the surrounding rock, identifying pieces and slowly reassembling them. When we find dinosaurs, sometimes we'll find individual bones or fragments of the skeleton, and often they're jumbled up. It's kind of like pickup sticks. As Mark uncovers more and more, it becomes increasingly clear just how distinct and how unique this specimen is. In a three-dimensional sense and just a level of detail, this animal is really well preserved. After six years of painstaking work, the Royal Tyrrell Museum in Drumheller, Alberta, unveils its rare and astonishing discovery. The announcement stuns the world. It looks like when you look at this dinosaur, you are seeing what animals 110 million years ago would have seen. You're seeing the true three-dimensional shape. You're seeing the skin. It really does look like it was just frozen in mid-motion and preserved that way. We knew people were going to love it. It appears to be an 18-foot-long notosaur a type of armored dinosaur. Armored dinosaurs are called ankylosaurs, and there's two main groups of ankylosaurs. There's ankylosaurid ankylosaurs, the ones that eventually evolve a tail club, and notosaurid ankylosaurs, which always keep a flexible tail. But no one has seen a notosaur species like this. It was a stout, heavily armored animal with massive shoulder spikes and a long tail. It was an animal that would have plants uh, for a living and would not have been particularly dangerous unless threatened, at which point it might have been very dangerous indeed. It's a major discovery, a brand new species with an adult weight up to 3,000 pounds. They name it Boreello Pelta. It literally means Shield of the North. Boreal Pelta is easily one of the best preserved dinosaur fossils of any kind ever found, and it's unquestionably one of those one in a billion shots. After six years of work, the scientists have identified the victim. But many mysteries remain. With this exceptional fossil and the evidence that's preserved with it, that could allow us to answer all sorts of questions about what its last few days were like and possibly how it came to die. Just like in a crime scene, you have evidence of what could have happened. There's the state of the body and how it's lying, where it's lying. So you have to look at every bit of evidence very carefully and put together the most logically plausible sequence of events that explained how this body got to be where it is. A lot of the clues are on the body. These could be clues related to trauma, could be how the animal was living just before it died. The cause of Boriello Pelta's death is the ultimate cold case, a mystery 110 million years old. Dawn returns to Ground Zero, the place where Boriello Pelta's body was found. And the way the rocks are built up, the oldest are at the bottom and the youngest are towards the top. So they really are digging down through time as they're doing this excavation. These sedimentary rocks, they're about 110, 150 million years old. And this distinct green unit, and that's the exact same layer that Boreallo Pelta was found in. The position of the body in the greenish layer of rock is striking. When we came here, we saw what were probably the feet sticking up. It looked like the body was upside down on its back with the arms and legs sticking up. An upside down body encased in green rock prehistoric clues sealed for eons. But perhaps the most surprising thing is the dinosaur's location. If we were walking here 110 million years ago, we would be underwater. This was the bottom of a giant seaway. We would be walking on the seabed. There'd be creatures swimming above me. Way back then, a giant inland sea flooded the interior of the continent right over what would later become North America's plains. Borealopelta as a land-living animal is perfectly adapted for life on land. 
And the last thing it could do is be an effective swimmer. So what was a one and a half ton armored dinosaur doing here, upside down, on the bottom of a prehistoric sea, miles from shore? One hundred and ten million years ago, during the Cretaceous, this region was a semi-tropical land. What are now the foothills of the Rocky Mountains were then lush coastal shores, perfect habitat for large plant-eating animals like nodosaurs, and for those that eat meat. Carnivorous dinosaurs looking for prey. Was there a predator? A perpetrator big enough and fierce enough to take down an armored tank like Foriello Pelta. The Cretaceous would have been a scary place to be. We had enormous predators, some up to 40 feet long. Lindsay Zano studies the evolution of predators across the Cretaceous period. We have a pretty good understanding of predator diversity in the early Cretaceous. The Cretaceous begins here at the end of the Jurassic period, about 145 million years ago. And it spanned 80 million years of geologic time. Over this period, any number of predators may have held the apex position, the king of beasts. But which ones might be prime suspects in the death of Boreolo Pelta? At the end of the Cretaceous, only one megapredatory dinosaur ruled North America. This was Tyrannosaurus rex. But in the mid-Cretaceous, when Borealopelta was alive around 110 million years ago here, the top predator of the day would have been an animal known as Acrocanthosaurus. Acrocanthosaurus was a formidable predator. It was, up until this point, the largest predator that had lived in North America. It had powerful arms with three-fingered claws and blade-like, enormous teeth. There were also enormous raptor-like dinosaurs that lived during this time period, uh, animals similar to Utah raptor. So these are 1,000-pound raptors with enormous sickle claws on their feet, highly intelligent animals, probably with complex social behavior as well. There were even early relatives of the infamous Tyrannosaurus rex, but much smaller than you'd think. These are animals that are only about 200 pounds, small enough to be able to look you dead on in the eye. No less scary, mind you, they were extremely intelligent, they had strong bite forces, and they were very speedy. But Borealis Pelta would have laughed at an animal that small, like these early Tyrannosaurs were. At the Tyrrell Museum, Don and Caleb consider the likely perpetrators so we've got Moros here. It's a smaller Tyrannosaurid. Yeah, it fits better for time. This thing is a lot smaller than Borealopelta. I just could not see it tackling. Yeah, I agree. I think we can eliminate that one. Yeah. Uh, Utah Raptor, obviously a very formidable predator, lethal claws. Maybe this thing could have done some damage to Borealopelta. But the teeth are so small. Yeah, very small. And the hide is going to be super thick. Yeah. So. This thing would have to work so hard to get its meal. These teeth couldn't get through it. OK. Acrocanthosaurus. Oh, huh, interesting. I think this is a much better suspect. Time-wise, it works out pretty good. It does have very large teeth and very capable of slicing and causing damage. It would be good at puncturing a hide, cutting down into the flesh, and then combine that with neck and jaw muscles, it could pull off chunks of flesh. Yeah. So it's definitely evolved to attack, dismember, and eat large things. If we were going to propose that there was a violent death for Borealis pelta, it would probably be caused by something like Acrocanthosaurus or a very close relative. In the foothills of the Rocky Mountains, paleontologist Rich McCray and his team are examining rare clues to Borealis Pelta's world. Hey, Ryan, how's it look? Good so far. All right, let's go do it. The tectonic forces that uplifted the Rocky Mountains also lifted these from horizontal to vertical. Today, these exposed cliff faces are littered with the unmistakable tracks of animals long since extinct. This area was like a big dinosaur highway. 
It was teeming with life. Including armored dinosaurs. It's the best place in the world to see ankylosaur trackways. Rich and his team have been mapping the tracks to learn as much as they can about these animals. Well, being on this wall with these dinosaur tracks, this is the closest that you can get to observing the behavior of these animals when they were alive, unless you got a time machine and went back in time and to observe them in person. The great thing about tracks is that it breathes a little bit of life into the bones and it tells us things about behavior, environment, and biomechanics, how the animal lived and what other animals it lived with. What we have here is the hindprint of an armored dinosaur, has four distinct um, digits for toes, and the front foot has five digits. It's very possible that these tracks could have been made by a Borealopelta. They're the right morphology, the right shape, and the same age as the Borealopelta specimen that was discovered. Borealopelta may have walked here 110 million years ago. And for scientist Mike Habib, the tracks provide even more clues. He specializes in reconstructing how extinct animals like Borealopelta moved and potentially defended themselves. A track wave doesn't tell us that much about the anatomy of the animal, but it does tell us a lot about its behavior. It tells us something about its speed and its overall size and rate of travel. The dinosaur tracks are right around this corner. Adult notosaurs like Borealopelta were big and heavy. Mike wants to figure out if they could have been fast enough to elude a fierce predator. So here we are. Big suckers. Yeah. So we want to know how fast Borealopelta could move. But to do that, we need trackways. The only remaining direct evidence of how fast the animal was moving when it was alive. The distance between footprints will help determine speed and gait. These are really going to go a long way in terms of providing some really good data for our walk animations and physical models that we want to build for these critters. So there, we got the basic outlines. So now that we have consistent marks, we can measure between them. That's 85.3 centimeters. And that'll give us the distance between, say, a left foot fall and the next left foot fall. That's uh, 1 meter 30, exactly. This will give us a good idea, for example, if this animal was really likely to be able to outpace a predator when threatened, or if this is going to be more of a turn and fight kind of animal. A bit of fluorescent paint and nightfall helps bring these trackways eerily to life. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. It's almost like seeing the footprints of a ghost. You're kind of glowing in the hillside. In a way, it is. It's kind of a ghost of the past, you know? We know there are big theropods around that might be a threat to an animal like Borealopelta. Yeah, yeah. That leaves some questions about how they would defend themselves. Would they try to outrun it? They have armor, so maybe that protects them. Maybe they can hunker down, or maybe they have to turn and fight. Mike will take the data collected here back to his lab, where he has a new way to bring Borealopelta to life. In Los Angeles. So here it is at the walk pace. Armed with the trackway data and anatomical measurements from Borealo Pelta, Mike Habib and animator Jake Bardsey recreate how the nodosaur may have moved 110 million years ago. So I see you've matched the stride length to the trackways. Yes. So we're now set up to do some really interesting virtual experimentation of Borealo Pelta. Let's uh, speed it up a little bit and see what All you right. got in terms of the fast walk. Using the virtual model, Mike and Jake test out various stride frequencies to estimate a likely top speed. You can see very quickly, this is probably about as fast as this animal could manage, maybe even a little bit more. It's not going to be able to keep this up very long. I think that tells us pretty clearly that this is an animal that could be active in its own self-defense, but not by running away. This animal is not going to be out running any of the predators of its time. Acrocanthosaurus is almost certainly much faster than Borealopelta. This animal would have to turn and fight, essentially, if threatened by a predator. In fact, based on animations, it's unlikely Borealopelta could run at all. If Borealopelta couldn't outrun its enemies, it had plenty of other ways to deter them. One of the most obvious defensive aspects of this animal is its size. 
It was about five and a half meters long and weighed three or four tons. So it would have taken a very large animal to be able to mess with this thing. It was also covered a head to tail in osteoderms. These are bits of bone that are embedded in the skin and they form this kind of chain mail armor all the way down the body. They're actually interlocking or overlapping in some places. And then right here in the shoulder region, there's this really long spike coming to a very abrupt point. These may have been very effective anti-predator defense structures when the animal was alive. Very few structures in the animal kingdom have just one function. Victoria Arbor says there's more to spikes in armor than just defense. When you see something like a huge spike, that could simultaneously be a signal to mates that you're in good quality health. It could be a signal to predators not to mess with you. It's often there in order to fight with members of your own species. And that's usually over territory, resources, or mates themselves. And emerging science is pointing to an entirely different line of defense. As new technology is incorporated into paleontology, we're able to look at fossils at a whole new scale, which allows us to see little teeny tiny things that are preserved in the fossil that we didn't even know were there previously. Scientists are finding clues hinting at the original color of prehistoric animals, including dinosaurs. Growing up, we would see dinosaurs portrayed in a certain way where they were grays and green colors that looked a lot like lizards that are around today. But since we've been incorporating these new technologies into paleontology, we've started finding pigment. Pigments help produce an animal's coloring, and that can provide camouflage, a key form of defense. When an international team analyzed a thin film covering the fossil of Borealo Pelta, they discovered a surprising feature. It was found that at least one component of Borealo Pelta's color was this reddish brown, and that the pigment seemed to be concentrated on the back of the animal and not the belly. And this is consistent with this idea of countershading. When an animal is only one color, its shaded underside makes it stand out from its background. But with countershading, a type of camouflage, the animal has evolved a lighter colored belly than its back, counteracting the effect. This allows the animal to blend into its surroundings. If an animal is camouflaged, that's an indication that there's a reason it needs to be camouflaged. It's hiding from something. But what would happen if Borealo Pelta was spotted and attacked? Could an apex predator even pierce the dense armor? Mike Habib. Hey, Seamus, let's see this armor. He's meeting with physicist Seamus Blackley to test a replica that estimates Borealo Pelta's armor. So this is the rear haunch of the notosaur that we talked about. We laid down some ribs, some silicon connective tissue. Nice. Um, then on top of it, we developed a polymer that we cast into these scales that have the right level of hardness and the right mechanical properties to match what we think was actually on the animal. Oh, that's perfect. And the, the bone that you included? It's cast so that it has the same fracture characteristics as bone. Seamus has been working on a two-part system to test what would happen if Acrocanthosaurus bit Borealo Pelta. The first part of this is the armor of Borealo Pelta, built from a series of custom materials to match what we think the armor of Borealo Pelta was able to do. But you didn't just build the perfect armor, though. I know you've also built the perfect predator. When you see the predator, you might be a little bit worried for, for Notosaur. <laughs> All right, Mike, let me introduce you to our Acrocanthosaurus. This is Kathy. Oh, what a beast. Hello, Kathy. Mike, this is as near as we can produce to a mechanically accurate, force accurate Acrocanthosaurus head. She has 48 teeth made out of a special porcelain that we slip cast and then fired so that we have the same strength and fragility, we think, as the teeth of this animal. And gosh, it's terrifying. It really is. I particularly like the warning sign on the side.
I'm really curious to see how Boreal Peltas armor is going to hold up under a bite from Acrocanthosaurus. Go look at the angle, Mike. Do you like that relative to the mouth? Yeah. They set up to simulate a bite on Borealopelta's haunch. Bite force on Acrocanthosaurus was thousands of pounds per square inch. But when you look at what it's up against, this is a very tough armor. This is going to be highly destructive, I think, one way or the other. All right. OK, can you hold it there? Yep. Watson? We're ready. All right, we're go. Firing on. Homing. Three, two, one, fire. <laughs> Notice or did really well. Well, it lost osteoderms, broke those off. That's a sustainable loss. The keratin, it can regrow. Are we bleeding at this point? I mean, there'd be, yeah, be some bleeding. Let's give it another bite, see what happens if she took a second bite. All right. All right. Watson. Three, two, one, fire. Oh. OK. <laughs> That's now just a fountain of blood. You can see the ribs. There are the ribs. Yep. This is the connective material on the ribs. That's a rib right there, right? And it's, oh my god, Michael. The rib is shattered. Shattered. Oh, it sure is. Look at that. So this is a slow motion video of the second bite. Oh, that's just oh brutal. Oh, my god. Oh, that's just awful. I'm a physicist, not a physician, but that looked like a tremendous amount of organ damage right there. Yeah. I'm very impressed with both our critters, to be honest. Boreal Pelta held up a little better than, than I might have expected. But it really also, I think, tells us that if Boreal Pelta was attacked by an acrocanthosaur, you would see evidence of that. That's really fun to watch, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> Based on our bite tests, it's highly unlikely that a Boreal Pelta would sustain a major bite from a big predator and not show any signs. If the animal was killed by an acrocanthosaurus, it would be really obvious. If the real Boreello pelta died in a similar attack, there should be vivid evidence of damage on its body, the signature of a Cretaceous killer. In their quest to find out how a newly discovered species of armored dinosaur died, a team at the Royal Tyrrell Museum in Alberta, Canada, has scoured the body for signs of a fight. I spent roughly 7,000 hours preparing the specimen. I've been over every square millimeter. So far, I haven't seen any evidence of an attack from a predatory dinosaur. No foul play? Uh, none that I could see. With no evidence of an obvious cause of death, Don and Caleb go back to the drawing board, hoping to find new clues by focusing on the question, how did this dinosaur come to be so well preserved? It looks so close to being freshly dead, I could almost hear it breathing. You just, you know, imagine it giving its last gasp. I'll never stop being impressed by it. When you consider that Borealopelta came to be buried and preserved hundreds of kilometers from where it was living, the fact that it's so well preserved is a big surprise. Why was it not scavenged, rotted, and fallen apart? Only a tiny fraction of animals fossilize after they die, and the ones that do are almost always left as disarticulated bones, like these from an ancient riverbed. Very different than Boreal Opelta. When you find a specimen that has excellent preservation and it's very complete, then there are many things that you can eliminate in terms of how it died. Understanding what happened to Boreal Opelta after it died could be key to solving the cold case. I studied the processes of death and decay and disintegration. Some people might find that a little morbid, but I found it a fascinating kind of study because I have the focus on the fossil record. Kay Berensmeyer is a world-renowned expert in taphonomy, the study of how animals decay and turn into fossils. When you find a fossil with a high level of preservation, it does not tell you the cause of death, but it does tell you 
about circumstances that happened right after death. Kay's research into death and decay provide important clues about what may have happened to Borriello Pelta after it died. This is a time-lapse decomposition sequence of a lizard called a tegu in Florida. The time-lapse reveals the normal stages of decomposition over just two months. Wow. So it bloats up so quickly. There's almost a point where you expect it to just explode, and yes. then it doesn't. But it does seem like it ruptured on the lower side, because you see the skin coming up. It's the stomach cavity that expels the gas. The fluids that were released fed the organisms that are making the soil move. The fact that the skin preserves for so long is really, really interesting. And you do see it moving, and you can tell that there is something going on inside of the body. A friend of mine once said that you're never so alive as when you're dead. Yes. <laughs> you can actually see in a decomposing body movement. The maggots, and the larvae of the insects, the beetles that are in there pulling things apart. What we have here after two months is a pretty disarticulated, messed up looking carcass. When you have a complete specimen, a much more well-preserved one, it means that it hasn't gone through this process. Complete specimens are rare. Something happened to Borealo Pelta soon after it died that protected it from the natural process of decay and disarticulation. Something that had to be nothing short of extraordinary. The body was found in a greenish rock rich in a mineral called glauconite. Oh yeah, there's the green right there. Glauconite tells us it's a marine rock. It also only forms in water that's at least 50 meters deep. So we've got a minimum depth of burial for the Borealopelta carcass. When you look at this rock, there are no burrows in here. There were no little creatures crawling around the seabed. So the carcass probably came down in an area that was poor in oxygen, which contributed to it staying intact. And there was something else. When we came here to excavate the fossil, we saw that it looked like the carcass hit the seabed with enough force to deform the sediments. There'd be clouds of silt and mud flowing around. That's what probably sealed it away from scavengers. The lack of scavengers helped preserve the dinosaur's soft tissue, like its skin. But what about its shape? Why wasn't Borealo Pelta flattened by the crushing ravages of deep time, like almost all other dinosaur fossils? This remote site in southern Alberta holds an important clue. This is a concretion. It forms in sedimentary rock, and it represents a very hard rock that's resisting erosion. Concretions are like nature's concrete. They're especially hard, and they're really strong. Concretions like these can form through a chemical reaction, when organic material, like a body, acts as a catalyst that cements the rock stronger than surrounding sediments. So the dead animal acts as a site where the minerals will start to grow around it. And with Borealo Pelta, that's a perfect example. You had this big chunk of dead tissue on the seabed, and that's what started the concretion to grow around it. concretion, and we find concretions pretty commonly in the rock record. You get them in all different kinds of sizes. You can find little teeny tiny ones. You can find huge ones. So this is a crab. You can see its shell, its little pincers. This crab is a few million years old, and it looks like it could have just died yesterday. It's three-dimensionally preserved because it's inside this concretion. The formation of the concretion around Boreala Pelta was absolutely vital to every aspect of its exceptional preservation. It stopped it from being squashed. It completely covered everything, sealed the body from the surrounding water, it also sealed it away from any oxygen. It was nature's sarcophagus, a time capsule that protected Borealo Pelta's body for millions of years. The mystery of Borealo Pelta's stunning preservation may be solved, but the cause of its death and how it ended up on the seafloor 
remain a mystery. Until an astonishingly rare find cracks the cold case wide open. When we realized that the stomach contents of Borella pelta were preserved, it really opened up a window. We could look at what this animal's last meal might be. Can the dinosaur's last meal help reveal its final moments? Paleontologists Caleb Brown and Don Henderson follow new leads to solve a prehistoric mystery, the cause of death of Borrello Pelta, the world's most perfectly preserved armored dinosaur. The animal's stomach contents, an extremely rare and potentially key piece of evidence, were miraculously fossilized. The stomach contents being preserved was almost too good to be true in terms of you had details about maybe its last meal preserved, which is kind of unheard of for dinosaurs. It is eight and a half centimeters deep laterally. Okay. First, Don and Caleb measure the volume of the stomach. The maximum diameter, 36 and a half. Okay. The notosaurus final meal provides a rare investigative opportunity these blocks here, as well as those blocks there, are smaller chunks of rock from that uh, abdominal mass, from the stomach contents of the notosaur. And in this case, they happen to be consumed plant material. The small chunks of stomach contents are processed into thin slices and sent off for expert analysis. While the team awaits the results, Don turns his attention to how Borealo Pelta came to rest so far from home. We know that Borealo Pelta, like other armored dinosaurs, was living on these coastal plains. It was very flat. The bones of many armored dinosaurs were fossilized in prehistoric riverbeds that drained into a primordial interior sea. Don thinks there might be a telling pattern. Here's a map of Alberta. I would like to map out for all the armored dinosaurs found in Alberta, which ones were preserved belly up and which were preserved belly side down. Let's use red markers to show belly up and we'll use black to show belly down. Well, we know this one. Or Alapelta from the Clearwater Formation, upside down. We have an Ankylosaurus from the Scholard Formation, upside down. We have an Anodontosaurus from the Horseshoe Canyon Formation, which was also upside down. We have an indeterminate ankylosaur, which is right side up. Okay. We have another right side up, upside down, upside down, upside down, upside down. Edmontonia lying on its side. And then two more, both upside down. Okay, this is my last red one. Okay. I think we see a pattern. About 70% of the armored dinosaurs found in this province are found on their backs with their arms and legs sticking up in the air. One idea is that armored dinosaurs were just plain clumsy. If they fell over onto their backs, they might not have been able to right themselves. I think that was left over from the old idea that dinosaurs had apparently such tiny brains that they were just dumb, but we don't think of that. There's another idea that predators would be flipping them over to get to the soft belly region, but we don't have any evidence for predation on these things. There's no bite marks, there's no missing chunks, that sort of thing. Don believes one theory might hold water. When animals die and their immune system shuts down, bacteria and other microorganisms start to digest the body. As it rots, gases build up within the body cavities and the stomach kind of extends. Kay's time-lapse of a decaying lizard indicates the bloating phase of decomposition occurs within days after death. Don suspects something remarkable happened to Borealo Pelta after it bloated. I have here a roasting pan, which represents the stiff armored back and sides of the animal. And then we have the ball. This will be the soft belly region of the animal. If the bloating carcass ends up in water, like the top heavy body of Borealo Pelta did, simple physics will prevail. The most stable configuration is for the heavy to be below and the light above, and that would explain why these armored dinosaurs are flipping over onto their backs. 
Bloat and float would explain why Borealo pelta was found upside down. But what about the cause of death? The analysis of the stomach contents could help break the case. With these preserved stomach contents, we reached out to David Greenwood, who's a paleobotanist, so he works on fossil plants. Hi. Oh, David. We're collaborating with him to determine what types of plants are preserved there. You have some uh, exciting updates for us regarding the slides. I do, Caleb, indeed. Looking at the stomach contents of Boreopalter, it's, we can confirm it was a well-fed animal. Most of it appears to be a leaf material, and in particular, probably close to 80% of what this guy had eaten was ferns. What's the other 20%? Uh, there was in twigs. What is interesting about the twigs is that they do tell us time of year. And what do they say in terms of time of year? Well, it looks like it was mid-growth. So most trees put on annual rings. So this has four and a half growth rings. But the last growth ring is halfway. So it's not showing any sign of the transition into fall. So that's telling me it's probably mid to late summer. It was the wet season for our dinosaur's last meal. It's so nice to see that. It's a key piece of evidence. Determining the time of death could bring Don and his team closer to potentially solving the mystery. I think we've got a pretty good case to explain how this thing came to be dead on the seabed. We know that Borealopelta, like other armored dinosaurs, was living on these coastal plains. It would have been eating large quantities of ferns. Borealopelta's stomach contents indicate it was summer, a wet season. I imagine extreme storm comes through, heavy rains, rapid rise in water level. The place is so flat that once the river broke its banks, the landscape would have been flooded. I think the cause of death of Borealopelta would have been drowning. As the animal started to rot, gases build up within the body cavity. That bloated body with the soft belly and the dense back causes it to flip over. Its arms and legs will be sticking up in the air. The flooded river would carry it to sea. It's going to travel a long way before it goes pop. And it goes down like a stone. Boreello Pelta's body hits the seafloor with enough force to bury itself. That concretion started to grow around it. It would have been sealed in that concretion for 110 million years and buried by rock until it was hit by the excavator back in 2011 when the story of Boreella Pelta starts. The coldest of all cold cases may have been solved, at least based on available evidence. And Don's verdict? Death by drowning. Putting it mildly, this will be a memorable career moment. But I would never say this is case closed. There's still more to learn. We're always looking at new details. I'm sure it has a lot more secrets to be revealed, and I hope to be around when more of those secrets are revealed. <laughs>